We are going to start this course on nanostructured materials, synthesis, properties, self assembly and applications. Uh, the course has uh, four modules and uh, today we will be doing module 1 and the first lecture of module 1 which is the introduction to nanotechnology. And uh, I am from IIT Delhi, Department of Chemistry and I uh, will be giving you 40 lectures on this subject. Now, uh, before we go to nanomaterials, we have to know what are materials. So, uh, there are different kinds of materials which you can observe around you in your daily life. Some of the materials are natural like the garnet or quartz or gold or silver or marble. There are many uh, naturally occurring elements and compounds which you can see uh, which occur in the earth. And there are man-made materials. For example, you have a cement or a compact disc or an IC chip which are made up of different kinds of materials. For example, silicon is the material for an IC chip and you have several interconnects made of silver which connect, uh, which make the connections in an IC chip. Apart from that, you can see there are a lot of drug molecules which are used in pharmaceuticals or dyes and pigments which are used in daily life. These are man-made materials and uh, most of the materials that we can see with our naked eye is has to have a size which is within the dimensions of the visible rays which is 300 to 600 nanometers. We are using visible rays to see them with our eyes and we cannot see objects which are smaller than 0 0.07 millimeters with our human eyes. Now, if you look at these materials uh, more carefully, that is inside these materials, if we have something by which we can observe uh, objects much smaller than 0 0.07 millimeters, like using electrons, then we can see that these materials are made of particles or grains which are of the size of 1 to 100, uh, uh, 100 to nanometers to 1000 nanometers etcetera, which is like 1 micron or to 10 microns. This is the normal uh, size of grains in any solid which we find around us. However, as you know that our eyes cannot see these small size grains. So, we have to use what is called an SEM which is a scanning electron micrograph uh, through a microscope. And this scanning electron microscope uses electrons which have a wavelength which is uh, correspondingly smaller, much smaller than the wavelength of visible rays and hence we can see objects which are much smaller. Now, a micron is 1 by 1000 of a millimeter. So, it is much smaller than 1 millimeter. And if you want to observe still smaller objects like atoms in a solid, then you have to use even smaller wavelengths because the distances in a solid on the atomic scale is of the order of 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers. Uh, typically in a crystal which is of say 0.1 millimeter in dimension will have around 10 to the power 21 atoms. So, there are many many atoms in a small crystal and if you want to look at the distance between two atoms, it is of the order of 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers or 1 to 2 angstroms. 
And for that normally we use x-rays because x-rays have a wavelength which is of the order of 1 to 2 angstroms. Now, using these uh, x-rays we can observe the structures like diamond or uh, graphite or we can observe changes in the patterns of the arrangement of atoms like a dislocation where atoms have moved from their original positions. However, these in between this atomic limit and uh, the uh, micron sized limit which I discussed earlier which is found which can be seen using a scanning electron microscope. There is a regime which is the nano scale which we are discussing in this course. So, what is this nano scale? So, to give you an idea of what is this nano scale which is of the order of 1 to 100 nanometers. Uh, how to understand how small is a nanometer? So, to give you an idea if you compare the size of a football uh, or a soccer ball uh, with the size of the earth, then you see that the size of the football is around 10 million times smaller. And now, if you compare a nanomaterial like a C60 molecule, which is also called a fullerene, then the C60 molecule is nearly 1 billion times smaller than the size of a football. So, you can now imagine that how small is a nano particle if you know how small is the football with respect to the size of the earth and the fullerene molecule which is a nanoparticle is much much smaller than the ratio of the uh, earth size to the football uh, as compared to the size of the football to the nanoparticle. Now, nanoscale materials can be seen in many many places. For example, you can see in gold you can make nanoparticles, you can make silver nanoparticles, you can make uh, nano shaped objects like a quantum coral which is made by having iron atoms on a copper surface as shown here. And uh, you can see a three dimensional structure of silicon carbide nanowires in the form of uh, a flower and the size of these flowers are within a uh, few nanometers. So, you can have artificially made structures which have dimensions close to a nanoparticle that is in the order of 1 to 100 nanometers. So, uh, that means these particles are very small. If you have to understand nanomaterials, you have to see them using uh, light rays which have wavelength of the order of uh, 0.1 to uh, 1 to 10 nanometers of that order and that kind of uh, wavelengths you can achieve using electrons. And so, electron microscopy is important and you can see in these pictures which are electron micrographs of nanowires of carbon like carbon nanotubes which are oriented in some fashion. And these nanowires and nanotubes have very interesting physical, electronic and optical properties. So, nanomaterials which have this small dimension of uh, few nanometers can be in one dimension and the other two dimensions can be large or it may have this small dimension uh, of nanometer size in uh, two directions 
or even in three directions. Accordingly, we call them as uh, nano dots or uh, nano plates or nano wires depending on uh, the dimension of these nano structures. Now, if you have a two dimensional uh, quantum confinement which is possible if you have a nano structure like a plate with one dimension which is nanometer size, uh, then you can see what is called two dimensional quantum confinement because only in one dim dimension you have uh, the uh, effects due to the nano size. There are many, many applications of these nano devices. You can use them in sensors and actuators like motors which are called nano motors. You can use them in very efficient photovoltaic devices. You can use them in transistors and diodes as well as in lasers. And uh, a lot of work has been done and is currently being done on how to increase the efficiency of a solar cell which converts the rays of the sun into electricity, which is a very important uh, problem for the world to harness the solar energy and convert it into useful form of energy so that the energy problem of the world can be solved easily. There are other nanoscale materials or nanomaterials uh, which have relation to biological molecules and these are also uh, having dimensions in 1 to 100 nanometers. The examples are proteins, enzymes, uh, DNA, RNA and of course, peptides and there are many applications uh, in biomedical science which are based on the nanostructures and the utilization of the biological nanostructures in uh, medical science. Uh, some of these nanostructures can be uh, combined with uh, other inorganic materials to form bioconjugates and uh, they can be combined with polymers or carbon nanotubes and can be applied to, se uh, to several uh, problems related to drug delivery or uh, disease mitigation. Uh, there are uh, here some nanostructures of porous silicon which is uh, biocompatible and hence can be used with biomolecules. Similarly, there is an example of a human cell which has been fixed onto porous silicon. There is an example of enzyme which can be used as a catalyst uh, which are already known to be working as catalyst in the life processes and they can be used to have some artificial reactions carried out by in a similar environment outside the living bodies. You can have a bone cell grafted on porous silicon and studies have been done how these bone cells can be made to grow on artificial surfaces. So, uh, let us now understand what are the properties uh, which change as the particle size uh, becomes very small. So, uh, what is very small here is uh, with small we mean uh, the, the size of 1 to 100 nanometers, which is uh, not a rule, but it is a norm which is considered by all the people who work in the area of nanomaterials uh, to consider any material which has a size in this uh, range to be considered as a nanomaterial. Uh, and as defined, 1 nanometer is 1 by 1000 of a micron or a micrometer and typically in 1 nanometer you may have 3 to 5 atoms. Uh, to give you another idea of this uh, size of nanometer, if you take a human hair 
and measure the thickness of the human hair that is the diameter of the hair. Then the diameter of a human hair is of the order of 100 micrometers uh, which means uh, 1 lakh nanometer 10 to the power 5 nanometers. So, you can understand that a human hair ha is very large compared to, to the dimensions that we are talking about uh, which is 1 to 100 nanometers. So, unusual properties uh, are seen when you make a material which is of nanometer dimensions. Uh, one of the properties is that electrons which normally are delocalized in a metal uh, become confined that means they are not so free anymore. And then the property of the metal which is due to the delocalization of electrons is affected and the metal becomes a non-metal. Uh, this is considered to be a quantum effect because you change the uh, allowed energy levels of the electrons by confining them in a region. Uh, there are other properties like the surface to volume ratio of atoms changes as you uh, decrease the size of the particle, uh, which means that if you have a smaller particle, it will have more atoms on the surface compared to the bulk uh, and hence its properties like reactivity and other things will change as the size of the particle changes. Uh, there is a another property which depends on the orientation of dipoles which may be electric dipoles or magnetic dipoles and uh, a particle having these dipoles will show change in the uh, arrangement of these dipoles as you decrease the size of the particle. Uh, from a more ordered arrangement in a larger size particle, you will go to more disordered dipoles as you decrease the diameter of the particle. On the surface of the particle, you will have more disorder and since surface increases with size uh, with decrease in size of the particle. Hence, the disorder of the dipoles increases with decrease in size of the particles. Now, if you look at a scale where our nano scale objects fit, then you see that if you go from the smallest particles or smallest uh, numbers that we can see like 10 to the power minus 15 of a meter which is called a femtometer and you go up you see the that the size of the atom is around 10 to the power minus 10 of a meter which is one angstrom and then you see a water molecule is something which is below 1 nanometer but more than 1 angstrom and then if you go to a dna double strand then the size falls into uh, the nanometer dimension. The diameter of a DNA is around 2.5, uh, so uh, in 2.5 to 5 uh, angstrom, so it is near to the nanometer size and the diameter of a carbon nanotube is higher than it is around say 5 to 10 or 20 nanometers. So, typically these objects fall in the nano dimension. Of course, if you go to larger sized objects like bacteria or RBCs, they are much larger. They are like uh, 200, 300 nanometers to 500 nanometers or micron sized. So, we see a small region in this entire length scale uh, where you will have objects of the size of having the nano dimension like the DNA strand and the carbon nanotubes and the wide assays. Since some of these biomolecules are falling in na the nano dimension, hence uh, the subject of nanotechnology is equally important to chemistry, physics and biology. So, as I explained to you why uh, these properties of surfaces which dominate as the size of the particle increases, 
and the disorder of the dipole also increases as the size of the particle decreases. So, these two properties are depicted and you can see that for the same uh, area if you have a smaller size object you can you will have more number of particles to cover the surface and similarly if you have a smaller size particle the bulk which has ordered moments uh, reduces in dimension and the uh, number of disordered dipoles are increasing as the dimension of the particle decreases. So, just to again summarize what is happening as we are going from large sized particles to small sized particles. So, if you go from a millimeter sized particle to a micron sized particle there is not much change in the laws of physics. Okay. The physical laws are more or less same. However, as you go from the micrometer size to the nanometer size, you are entering the quantum region and so the laws of physics and the effects differ considerably. Apart from this, many of the biological molecules fall in the nanometer length scale and hence uh, the size dependence of the biological properties are also important. So, electronic properties change like you have new effects like quantum size effects they are called and examples are single electron tunneling or macroscopic quantum tunneling. Uh, these are uh, seen whenever you confine electrons and you start seeing these quantum effects. Uh, physical properties like melting point, hardness, etcetera, we are also dependent on the size of the particles and we see them in many cases. Then chemical properties change like the structure, catalysis, reactivity, they all change as you change the size of the particle. For example, a small gold particle is uh, shown along with a large gold particle and you see the large gold particle cannot uh, oxidize uh, carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Okay. Uh, whereas, the small particle of gold can oxidize carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. So, interfaces and surfaces become very important and uh, this is of course, known for a long time in catalysis and uh, they were not called as nanoparticles, but they were called as fine particles, uh, but in the last 15 years we now know that these properties uh, can be uh, are due to the nanomaterials and now we say that the enhanced reactivity is due to the uh, nanoparticle nature which enhances the surfaces and hence the reactivity. You can also see optical effects for example, uh, if you look at this butterfly then it has got on its wing uh, blue color as well as brown color and the color actually changes because there are uh, some nano structured uh, in, in the some nanostructures on the wings of these butterflies. Now, these nanostructures uh, interact with light in a manner uh, such that if you change the dimension of the nanostructures, uh, the wavelength of light which is uh, scattered will change and hence you see a different color. And this subject of uh, interaction of light with nanostructures is today called nanophotonics, where you can organize uh, elements such that the uh, difference between two nanostructured elements is of the order of the wavelength of the light which is interacting and minor variation in this dimension of these nanostructures will uh, create new uh, scattering uh, phenomena and this subject is called nanophotonics. Uh, you can this case of the butterfly is a natural uh, nanostructured feature showing nanophotonics. Uh, however, you can make artificial 
uh, surfaces which are nanostructured and uh, there also you can observe uh, variation in the scattered uh, wavelength of light depending on the distance between two nanostructured elements. Uh, you can also see the effect the of optical properties on the dimensions by choosing a very well known element like gold which all of you know that it is yellow in color. However, if you change the size of the particles of gold, you can have gold of different colors depending on the size of the gold particles. So, you can have blue colored gold, uh, orange colored gold depending on the size of the particles and you can explain why a particular size of gold gives a particular color. This can be very well explained today based on our knowledge of nanoscience and nanotechnology. This is another example of how you can understand why surface reactivity will be large. If you take a large cube and cut it into several small cubes, the surface area will increase and hence uh, for the given volume, you have much larger surface which is characteristic of nanoparticles and hence enhance any property which will depend on the surface like reactivity uh, or catalysis etcetera. So, the surface area is a very important uh, property for catalysts and uh, for the increasing the reactivity and there are many other applications in thin films where you use certain nanomaterials to act as thermal barriers. Uh, to prevent something from getting too much heated or the wear resistance of materials which are being used uh, rapidly and these kind of wear resistance of materials can be enhanced by uh, decreasing the size of the particles uh, on the surface. Now, in electronics uh, the size is very important because you want to make smaller and smaller uh, electronic gadgets and uh, what we call as the feature size that is typically an electronic component which can you can consider an integrated chip. Its size uh, is of major importance because the more number of chips you can put per in one square inch of area you will have larger uh, computational properties or uh, any uh, feature like memory properties can be enhanced by increasing the feature size and that means uh, increasing the number of uh, ICs that means decreasing the feature size uh, will help you in enhancing most of the electronic properties. And as you see the feature size has decreased from around uh, 10,000 and now in, uh, in 1970 to it is now close to around 20 or 30 or 40 which is in the nano scale. Now, this kind of miniaturization nano scale miniaturization uh, has advantages because it also reduces uh, the length which an electron has to travel to communicate with different uh, uh, circuits within the same chip. So, be, uh, be between different components and this uh, also reduces electron scattering which leads to enhanced heating or resistivity and overall you get a faster operation of the device. Okay. However, uh, the more miniaturization you need, uh, you need to design more uh, difficult nanostructures and that will that normally enhances the cost of the fabrication process and you have to use much more complicated uh, equipments to design uh, such highly uh, miniaturized uh, devices. Now, to give you a brief history of a nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, nanoscience was known for a long time 
without any understanding. People have been making small particles which today we know were actually of the size of few nanometers uh, in ancient Roman times. They used to make particles of cobalt, silver, etcetera in solutions and used to mix it to form glasses uh, which had color. And this was known for nearly 2500 years back, people have made such colored glasses. Uh, however, uh, the chemistry or the exact science behind the color in these colored glasses uh, was not known or not understood. Gold is one of the most frequently used uh, colloidal solutions, which has been used in many other applications in those days. Uh, and this particular uh, cup, which you are seeing, has got gold, which is uh, looking red uh, when uh, you are illuminating. That means, you have a light inside. So, you are looking at the transmitted light and that is red in color. However, if you look at the reflected light, that means your light source is outside the cup, then it appears green in color. And this is uh, currently in the London Museum and it was made many, many thousands of years back and it is still retaining its colored properties. So, this unusual property of this glass is basically because there are nanoparticles of gold embedded in the glass and that gives you the color. Then the color is different depending on whether you are observing transmitted light or reflected light. The first time scientifically nanoparticles were made in a laboratory was 1857 when Michael Faraday made a gold solution. And those solutions are stable even now. As you can see in these uh, chemical bottles, these are precisely those gold solutions which were made by Michael Faraday in 1857. And if you look at these particles under a microscope, electron microscope, then you will see the picture on the right hand side, which shows you clearly the uh, pattern which one should observe for a gold particle and you can be sure from the spacings between these lines that you observe that corresponds to gold and this is a transmission electron microscope picture of gold nanoparticles from which you can see the size of the particle and also you can prove that it is a gold particle by measuring the distances between the atoms or the lines which are formed by the atoms in real space. Now, uh, the scientific uh, thrust to nanotechnology was really given by Richard Feynman, who was a physicist and uh, was a very important figure in the development on modern physics. And he gave a lecture in 1959, where he mentioned that a lot has to be understood in the smaller dimensions. And that is when he said that there is plenty of room at the bottom. And this is considered today one of the first time somebody indicated that lot of science and technology is possible in the nano dimension. However, he never mentioned the word nano science or nanotechnology in the lecture, but he kind of indicated that the understanding was not there on the properties or applications of particles in that smaller dimension where we can control atoms and molecules. The next big thrust and actually the major thrust came uh, after Eric Drexler, uh, who was a student at MIT, uh, wrote 
about molecular manufacturing in 1981 and another book called Engines of Creation in 1986, where he put his ideas about molecular machines, nano robots and many other uh, machinery which could be designed based on molecules. And uh, that was one of the major uh, thought provoking uh, books which people latched on to and made them reality within 10 years. So, Eric Drexler's uh, books though fiction uh, gave the thrust for scientists and engineers to start thinking on really making these molecular machines. And his concept of molecular machine started from a natural molecule which is the ribosome and which is there in our body and it is uh, the working of the ribosome is so efficient and based on that Eric Drexler uh, wrote the book Engines of Creation because ribosomes help in making proteins which are very important for uh, living beings. It, we all the time are making proteins in our body and ribosomes are one of the key things which stimulate the formation of proteins. And the structure of the ribosome and its action is just like a machine and that is why Eric Drexler got his idea of thinking beyond ribosome and planning or uh, of many, many new molecules which would be doing different action based on their structure. And hence, th this was realized of course, of later and the realization was possible because it could be seen using some microscopes which were then developed. One of those microscopes, the scanning tunneling microscope was invented in 1981 and we could clearly see atoms uh, using the scanning tunneling microscope. Although even with transmission electron microscope, you can see atoms at very high resolution. The buckyball was discovered around this time in 1985, which is a nanoparticle because the diameter of this buckyball or C60 molecule is around uh, 7 angstrom or few nanometers, uh, 7 nanometers, uh, which is 70 angstroms. So, this discovery of C60 was nearly around the time when nanotechnology was or nanomaterials was uh, being recognized as a very important area of research. However, the most important discovery probably was the discovery of, or invention of the atomic force microscope by the same people who invented the scanning tunneling microscope and the AFM was invented in 1986 and using this microscope uh, any system any nanostructure could be seen like non-conducting molecules, organic molecules which could not be seen earlier using scanning tunneling microscope. So, the discovery of the atomic force microscope probably was one of the most important inventions in the development of nanoscience and nanotechnology. This is a picture of the first uh, writing using atoms done by IBM, where they could manipulate atoms. And this is uh, really what we call the ultimate of nano engineering, where you can move atoms at your will and place them at your will. So, this IBM uh, logo, which is written here, is made of xenon atoms. Uh, which the blue ones you can see are actually they have uh, manipulated xenon atoms on a nickel surface 
And this was first time shown in 1989. And, and from that day, we can now say that we can write with atoms. And what happens when you can write with atoms? When you write with atoms, you can write many, many thousands and millions of pages of your book in one page of your notebook today. So, a typical atom has a diameter of around 2 angstrom. So, that is the size of uh, the letter you will have 2 to 5 angstroms. And so, you can imagine how many letters you can write within one page of your notebook, which is around say 12 centimeters by 12 centimeters. It will be much larger than what you can write with your pen or pencil. And so, that is a very, very important development that you can store a lot of information in very small region of space using atoms or molecules. But you have to be able to manipulate these atoms and molecules as if you are writing with atoms and molecules. So, uh, there are several other uh, discoveries around that time. In 1987, the first single electron transistor was created. In 1991, carbon nanotubes were discovered. Uh, these are uh, tubes made up only of carbon atoms. The carbon atoms are arranged in as hexagons and pentagons and these tubes have the diameter of around 3 to 10, 15 nanometers. And these carbon nanotubes were later found to be very important for several applications. You can have semiconductor carbon nanotubes, metallic carbon nanotubes and uh, branched carbon nanotubes and hence the, it was predicted that they would be useful for circuitry in miniature electronic devices. Many countries in the world around that time then launched the nanotechnology program. United States launched the National Nanotechnology Initiative in 2000 and several other nano research centers in the world were established in around 2000 and 2002. Today, uh, what we have done so far is try to give you an introduction to the subject of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, we try to explain uh, what this small size brings about in terms of properties, uh, the variation in electronic properties, a variation in mechanical properties and variation on uh, properties which depend on surface like catalysis and reactivity. The points that you have to remember is first that the nano dimension is typically in the range of 1 to 100 nanometers. Any object or part of an object in this range has some unusual properties. However, it depends on what kind of properties one is looking at. If it is electronic properties, then maybe you have to be in the region of 1 to 10 nanometers. If you are looking for mechanical properties, you may be having particles which will create a variation in mechanical properties even at sizes like 40 nanometers, 100 nanometers, etc. So, overall, uh, you will have different effects based on what kind of properties you are looking forward. One of the common materials which is a nanomaterial we discussed is based on carbon, the C60 molecule and the carbon nanotube which is one dimensional, linear or it can be curved, it can make y junctions and the diameter of these carbon nanotubes of course, falls in the nanometer dimension the length can be very long. And how you observe these nanoparticles? You have to use light which has a wavelength which matches the dimensions. So, you must be using light which has a wavelength of nanometers, which visible light cannot give you. So, you have to use electromagnetic radiation 
which has wavelength in the order of uh, sub nanometer like electrons which can have wavelength which in this region. You can also use other particles, however, you have to modulate their wavelength accordingly. Uh, typically, the tools we use to study these nanoparticles we discussed today are the electron microscopes and the uh, scanning tunneling microscope and atomic force microscope. So, the TEM, the AFM and STM are the pillars of study of nanoparticles and using these we, we can observe even atomic, uh, we can have atomic resolution and see distances which are sub nanometer in size. Uh, with that, I think we will close the lecture, uh, the first lecture of this module 1 and then we will start with our uh, next lecture uh, next time uh, and good luck to all of you and please uh, go ahead and look at what you have learned and try to understand more. Thank you. Thank you.